So I want to open up with my, uh, at the start of this year, um, I had made a commitment to the church. And I said that I'd like to see the church get more involved. Um, and one of the ways that uh, I wanted the church to get more involved is by having members of the church come up and open up with our opening scripture. So today I have the privilege of my daughter opening up today's word. This is Acts um, chapter 9, verses 1 through 22. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one. But they led him by hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. Ananias, sorry. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying, and in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man. How much harm has he done to your saints in Jerusalem? And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on his brother, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days at, with the disciples at Damascus. Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on his name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priest? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this is Jesus the Christ. Before I pray, I want to uh, be able to begin our prayer for today with uh, a couple petitions, a couple members of our church uh, who are going through some very difficult times right now. And uh, I talked uh, to Brother Angel yesterday, whose wife is uh, going through some serious medical uh, situation. Uh, and I want to lift her up in prayer today. Also, Brother Paul and Carissa, Carissa's grandfather, is, uh, is on his uh, last moments. Uh, you know, um, I shared with Paul, or he shared with me on Wednesday, uh, the tremendous testimony of his grandfather, of his, of his wife's grandfather. Um, and he was rejoicing in that. And there's a lot to be said about uh, when our loved ones are on that final journey into eternity that we that we rejoice because of the life that they've lived 
And so for that, we give thanks to God. So, Heavenly Father, we just come to you today, Father. Above all things, O oh Lord, lifting up two individuals, placing them before the throne, Lord. To Doris, O oh Lord, who will be going through a major surgery this week, we ask and pray, Father, that the healing hand that comes from you and you alone, O oh Lord, would pour forth a perfect manifestation of healing, O oh Lord, upon her. We pray for strength and encouragement for her, for her husband, for her children and grandchildren, that you, O oh Lord, would comfort them in these very difficult times. Lord, we pray for Carissa, for Paul, for all of her family, Father, that we lift up her grandfather, a great man from what we've been told, who has served and honored you greatly, Father. We pray that as you prepare his final moments on this earth, Father, that you allow his children and his grandchildren to rejoice in the great testimony that they will leave behind, Father. We pray, Father God, for peace and comfort for their family as well, Father. And so, Father in heaven, for all of us who are here today gathered to hear the word from you, Father, we pray, Father, for our hearts to be ready and prepared, Father, for this word will be spoken from the holy ground of your temple. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. The journey of Paul, there's, there's, two, there's two perspectives in Scripture that teach us much as Christians. The first is the story of the prodigal son. The story of the prodigal son is a story that many of us resonate with because it talks about the lost soul. And every one of us resonates with that story because every one of us at one point was lost in our life. And we hear at the end of that story, what is it that happened to the prodigal son when his father welcomed him back with open arms? But I find that the conversion of Saul, later to be called Paul, on the Damascus Road is an equal perspective for us to reflect on. Because Paul's conversion is a major lesson for all of us to recognize what happens. What is life beyond God saving us? And today I'm going to speak about that. How do you feel that you persecute Jesus? Do you feel that you do that? Does anybody, persecution is a very hard, hard, it's a very harsh word. In our culture, it drives thoughts of abusive treatment towards a person or a group of people. You can see what's going on in society today with the Black Lives Matter. There's a lot of discussion of oppression, harassment, persecution. As harsh as that word is, we must understand that we are guilty of persecuting Jesus. Jessica, in her opening words, before we got into worship, she said something that was so critical for all of us to reflect upon. And that is what's going on in society today can only change when the church rises up. When the church comes together to get involved and to make a difference in the world. But when the church is dormant, when the church is sitting at home, when the church is not involved, when the church isn't congregating, the church can't make an impact, it cannot make a difference. When Jesus appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus, why didn't he say this? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my church? Because isn't that what Saul was doing? Saul was out there killing Christians persecuting them, imprisoning them. But those weren't the words that Jesus said to Saul. He said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It was personal. The gloves came off for Jesus. He was sending a loud and clear message. You have messed with my bride. And when you mess with my bride, you mess with me. That's the message that Jesus was telling us. In recent, in recent weeks, I've talked much and I've cited this verse. And I believe that the Lord continues to speak to us through these words. 
And it was the two great commandments that Jesus had spoken to us. In the Gospel of Matthew, a religious leader, a lawyer, he approaches Jesus and he, he tries to stump him. And that's all they were trying to do, is trying to trap him, to try to you know, find him guilty of something that would, that would justify what they were going to do to him. And he tells them, he says, which is the greatest commandment? So Jesus looks at them and he says, thou shalt not, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and all thy mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And so before Jesus was crucified, he laid a foundation of the summary of all scripture captured in these two commandments. Love God with all your mind, heart, and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. It was it, that's it. If you embrace that and embody what the message of those two commandments are, then you are being obedient to God's expectation for your life. But let's fast forward now. Let's fast forward post-crucifixion. Jesus is now dead. There was a road on Damascus. His words to Saul were, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? What Jesus was saying was that why are you persecuting my people, my bride? In churches throughout the world today, there exists a mass persecution of Jesus. Church attendances are down throughout the world. A couple months ago, I shared some staggering statistics that happened post-World War II era, where church attendance was at an all-time high. Fast forward two months ago, where the decline in the church had dropped to a staggering 35, 40%. Fast forward from two months ago to today, where is church attendance today? Churches today are suffering with 15 to 20% attendance. Why is that? Because we continue to live in an era of lost hope. We continue to live in an era that where there is ungenuine faith, we continue to live in an era that is reaped from all the events that have happened in this year. There are many who need to hear this message today. Many who are missing from this church today, many who may hear this message uh, through others because it's the same message that threw Saul off his horse. What Jesus is saying to us today is not, why are you persecuting me? Why are you avoiding my bride? Why are you avoiding me? We are the body of Christ. We're living in historical days today. Days that are making an affront to the church. An affront to God. God is angry. He's outraged. And as he looks down on the mess of his created order, I can only imagine what he's thinking. I'm calling out all the lost. I'm calling out all those living in fear. I'm calling out all those who have been complacent. I'm calling out all those whose faith has withered away. I'm calling out all those who are waiting for the appropriate time to get their lives right. Because tomorrow is not promised to any one of us. It's a time to reflect on what you've been missing. The persecution of the church begins with the persecution of the bride. And right now, this bride is being persecuted. You are being persecuted and you don't even know it. We must reconnect as a body of believers. There are many individuals who are still living in fear and we must encourage them to come back to reconnect to the church. The following points are perspectives that we must reflect upon that challenge who we are as a body and how we will continue to persecute our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Just because you're here doesn't mean you're not persecuting them. Did you hear what I said? There are many who do not realize that every day of their life they are pure persecuting God. And you need to understand how you're doing it. You persecute God when you miss out 
and the obedience to come together as one family. You persecute God when you miss out on loving God in your obedience. And as a result, you fail to experience him. I don't know how people can do it today. How do you do it staying at home, not coming together with your church family? How do you experience the love of God? How do you stay encouraged if you're not connected? How do you do it? I, I don't understand how you do it. We are in a major falling away today. You miss out on loving Jesus by loving his bride who laid Jesus who laid his life down for his bride. We need one another. We need to hear God's word being shared faithfully by the anointed messengers that God has sent. We need to learn more about God's word and we're not gonna learn it in a vacuum. If you think that you can study God's word on your own and think you can be filled and edified and that's sufficient for your growth and expectation for, for what God wants from you, you bought the lie. The edification of the church happens when the church family comes together. I meet on Wednesdays with a half dozen brothers and we dive into God's word and it has been such a motivation for myself and my brothers that we're able to lift one another and understand the perspectives of God's word. Perspectives that sometimes have been a little twisted because we never truly understood. Because we took the moment in our life to sit down and open the word of God and we added our own doctrine, our own teaching and understanding of God's word. We're not that good. God's word has told us that we need teachers to teach us his word. I don't know of any individual in the history a biblical history that was self-taught, that learned his Bible, and arrived to a point of understanding God's will for himself or herself. When you're not coming together as a church, you miss out on encouraging one another. How many here need a word of encouragement from somebody from time to time? You get it here. In this church, you will be encouraged because when you're going through stuff, sometimes you need another brother or sister or perhaps you need the body of the church to come together and place hands on you and to pray for you and intercede for you. We need that. But you can't do that when you're locked up at home. You must be shepherd. We need a shepherd. We cannot go through life, going through life on our own. The parable of the lost sheep teaches us that. Because every one of us is going to go astray. It's not if, it's when. And oftentimes we go astray many times. Time and time again, we're going to get off the path. And we have nobody to encourage us, nobody to bring us back onto that path. Who's looking out for us? A pastor will do that for you. Is going to bring you together. He's going to check up on you. Your brothers and sisters in Christ will check in and say, how are you doing? What's going on? I was discouraged this week to hear something um, that was really troublesome for me. That when the body of believers is not connected to their own family, and that family is going through crisis, and nobody is checking up on them. It really makes me wonder. Where's your faith? When the church hurts, do we not have a moral obligation under the commandment of God for us to be there for one another? If an individual in the church is hurting, you have an obligation to intercede for that individual. How much more if it's a family member? I sh my wife knows this, uh, you know, with myself and my siblings, a day doesn't go by where there isn't a connection with me and all my siblings. That's the connection that we have with one another. We know everything that's going on within our families. We know the pains, the sufferings, we intercede every day for one another. 
We intercede for their friends, for their family, because that's what a family does. How much more the body of Christ? When the body of Christ is suffering and you're sitting at home and doing nothing, and you're not lifting up a phone to say, brother, I hear you're going through something. How are you doing? How are you feeling? What can I do for you? If that's not happening, question your walk with God. Because that's not the God that I serve. As that surely shouldn't be the God that you're serving. You must be an individual that rises up to stand in a gap for those who are hurting. That's the second. You're violating the second commandment that Jesus just gave us. You're not loving your neighbor. You're hating your neighbor. And hatred is like in the murder according to the Sermon on the Mount. Without an example, how do you live your life? I come to this church because I look forward to my brothers and sisters in Christ. I look forward to the spiritual filling of my passion. My spiritual mother is a tremendous, tremendous source of inspiration for me because she models Christ to me. If I don't have that, what am I modeling from? What's, what's the one thing in this world that's given me my direction on what I should be role modeling? It's the world. Because if you're not modeling Christ, there's only one other person that you're going to role model, and that's going to be the world. What's your ministry? Every one of us is commanded to be in some ministry. And if you're at home, if you're not doing anything, how do you actively engage the gifts that God has given you? How do you serve others? Are we not commanded to serve? Well, isn't that one of the great examples that Jesus has left us? To serve others. As we serve others, we serve the Lord. When you're not coming together, you're not in the center of God's will. We must learn to celebrate the gospel. This past week, that was the topic that we discussed during our study group. What is the gospel? What does it mean to you? And it was interesting how different individuals have looked at the gospel through different lenses. But there's only one gospel. And when you're looking at the gospel through your own eyes and it's a twisted gospel, it's a wonder why individuals are not drawn to you, are not drawn to the work of God in your life. Your testimony is a powerful thing. From time to time in this church, we have individuals come forth and share their testimony. Your testimony is an encouragement for us because there's times that we're going through our own little trial in life. And the very testimony that you are going to share about the work of God in your own life might be the very thing that's going to give a person hope and inspiration and encouragement to press on. We need those testimonies. But I can't hear your testimony if you're at home because you're still living in fear. There's a great delight that we bring to God when God sees his people are coming together. How does God feel? today that he sees the churches at 15, 20% capacity. And I understand, no one understand me. I understand that COVID-19 is a real, real issue. It's a problem. It's a very serious, I have family members who are going through some tough times right now with it. But we also know that there are means that we can still come together. Whether we do it through social distancing within the church, or we can at least still stay connected. And connected means that you're picking up the phone, that you're talking to individuals, you're engaging in Bible studies with other individuals. That's what I'm talking about. How many here look forward to coming together to worship 
as one body. It's a tremendous, tremendous gift that we receive when the body of believers comes together and all you're doing is practicing. I don't know if you know this. Our time of worship here, you're just getting rid of, you know, my son had the frog throat last week, I remember. Uh, he struggled getting some of the workers here in worship. Well, God is saying, get it right here because when you go into eternity, you'll be worshiping all day long. So we got to get it right here. And when we come together, we worship because we allow the presence of God to come within our midst and we're here to honor Him. We can't do that when we're not coming together. I was having a discussion this morning with uh, my son and Stephen. Um, as Jessica noted earlier, um, Stephen has started a ministry uh, through TikTok. And we have heard that he's making a tremendous impact. My uh, son and Stephen, uh, my children, they've had a number of uh, guests over our home a lot more lately. And I recognize that some of the individuals are individuals that may not be serving the Lord. And we welcome that because we realize that in what they are doing, these are young men who God is using mightily, that they're outreaching to other youth out there who may be lost in the world. And it's their testimony that has to testify the work in their lives. And at one point, they need to recognize that how they are entertaining these individuals, that they are showing them who God is through their own actions and through, through their own behavior. I encourage both of them that it's important that they minister and outreach to the other youth because there is a lost world out there. And we can continue to be in the world. And this is part of the message I wanted them both to understand. The Bible says, be in the world, but not of the world. So we must be careful that when we are fellowshipping with individuals who may not be believers of the same mind, that God has brought us with. That we can't place ourselves in a situation where we can fall from grace and we fall into the ways of the world. So it's important for my son and for Stephen. I, as, Steve, as uh, Stephen's uh, leader, and my son as his father, that it's my job, my duty to make sure that I keep an eye on them to make sure that they're doing things that are right. If I don't do it, I have failed them. If I allow them to continue to do things that are in the world, that I recognize that you're doing worldly things, then I am condoning that behavior. And so I wanted to remind them both is that you're on a great path, continue your journey. But there comes a time where you now need to throw the hook out or the net out, and eventually you're gonna bring in the fish. Because the reality is that the Word of God says that what you're doing, one of you is sowing the Word, the other one is watering it. It's not your job to save the souls of those that you're reaching out to. God will give the increase. And I wanted them to hear and understand that. Because sometimes you can get so wrapped up in the attention and, and, and it's all a great thing. And I continue to encourage that you do what you're doing. But there comes a time when you need to just throw it out there. One of the hardest things that we do when we're out there at, uh, doing the evangelizing part of our responsibility is that we get nervous. We say, I don't know how to speak Christ to somebody. I don't know how to share the gospel with somebody. Well, I got to tell you, none of us do. To this day at my age, I still don't know. But one thing I do know, I let the Holy Spirit take over. And when you truly have a faith that says, Lord, not I, but you, God takes over. And he gives you the words to share what you have to share. And so for both of you and for all the youth that are here today, I encourage you to continue to be used by God. When we're not coming together here in this church, we persecute one another. When we're not sharing in the sufferings of the body. That is persecution. The body is hurting. 
but the body is not being edified by the church. We are persecuting one another when we don't stand in the gap for one another. That's part of our responsibility as brothers and sisters. God didn't put you on this earth, didn't put me on this earth just for my own welfare, just for giving me what I wanted for myself. God has given me a ministry as a husband, as a father, as a deacon in this church, as a man of God, as a brother, as an uncle, as a grandfather. And every one of those hats that I have to wear, God is being visible by how I interact with everybody. I persecute the church. You persecute the church when the gifts that God has given you are not being used. When you see that your co-workers, your loved ones, your family is going through stuff and you're not there for them. God has given you the ability to teach others. Take what God has done in your life to teach others. Our commitment to Christ comes when we're here as one body, connected to one another, edifying one another, lifting up each other, when we're not doing that, we persecute Christ. I recall when I first came to faith, I learned this just this week. About 19 years ago is when I came to faith, when I truly came to faith, when God saved me. And it was this week that I finally got the revelation it's amazing. As much as I study, as much as I've studied God's word, as much as I have a passion for for just learning, and I, I, I just I, I just love that. Um, but God revealed this to me, and it was revealed by uh, Paul. He shared Paul, and I'm going to credit my brother Paul who shared this with me on Wednesday evening, as we're studying the gospel, the meaning of the gospel. What does the gospel mean to all of us? He shared this. He says. One day he was just listening to God's word. And he was so moved by the grace of God. That in and of itself moved him into saying, I'm in. That's it. I'm in. He understood the power of the gospel, the grace of God. And he surrendered to it. And he's never looked back from it. And I sat and I reflected on that after we ended our study. And I remember 19 years ago, sitting in Pastor John's church and hearing all the beautiful testimonies of people coming forward saying that I was lost, but now I'm found. I was a drug addict, but God pulled me from this. I was a great sinner, but this is what God. And testimony after testimony I heard for months that in order for me to acknowledge that I truly have been saved, I need a testimony. Well, I'm here to tell you, you don't need a testimony. You don't need a testimony. The testimony, if you want a testimony, this is a testimony. That your eyes were open and you're able to see. You see, Saul was out there on a the road and he was persecuting Christians. He thought what he was doing was being obedient to the will of God. He was a Pharisee, individual who was commanded to go out and do what his leaders were telling him to do. But God had to knock him off his horse and say, why are you persecuting me? And he blinded him for three days. But when his eyes were opened, a great revelation occurred. That's what happened with Paul, my brother Paul. That's what happened with me because I didn't have a great testimony. I can look back and I say, well, you know, well, maybe it was when I went through my divorce. Maybe it was when, when, you know, no, it's not that. You know, I don't know when God saved me. But 19 years ago, Paul just taught me something. 
God saved me when my eyes were open. I was able to see the gospel for what it was. I was lost because I was buying the lies that I had lived for so many years. When you get to that point that you realize that you need God above all things, and it's only by grace, by grace. You know what grace is? It's the unmerited favor of God. It is God saying, I'm gonna give you this. You don't deserve it, but I'm giving it to you because I love you. And it's that love of God that I embraced 19 years ago. And today, I celebrate and I'm grateful. And Paul, I thank you that God used you. It took 19 years for me to see that. 19 years. And I've been up here preaching from this pulpit for many years, never understanding that. But that's the beauty of God's word. That's the beauty of God's work in our life is that you can be going through life for many years and not get a revelation until God's appointed time. Why did God wait 19 years for me to see that? I think the best is yet to come. We must stop persecuting Jesus. We must come together to reunite with a body of believers. For those who are so nervous about coming out, pick up a phone, join us through a study group. We miss you. We need to see you. We want to pray for you. We want to know what you're going through. I want to close with a devotional. A devotional from a tremendous man of God known as Oswald Chambers. <clears throat> this was a, a devotional that spoke about the persecution of Christ. And I want you to pay attention to the words that Brother Oswald Chambers shared. He says, are you determined to have your own way in living for God? We will never be free from this trap until we are brought into the experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. Stubbornness and self-will will always stab Jesus Christ. I'm gonna say that again. Stubbornness and self-will will always stab Jesus Christ. It may hurt no one else, but it wounds his spirit. Whenever we are obstinate and self-willed and set our own ambitions, we are hurting Jesus. Every time we stand on our own rights and insist that this is what we intend to do, we are persecuting Jesus. Whenever we rely on self-respect, we systematically disturb and grieve his spirit. When we finally understand that it was Jesus we have been persecuting all this time, it is the most crushing revelation ever. I'm gonna say that one again, and I want you to listen. When we finally understand that it is Jesus that we've been persecuting all this time, it is the most crushing revelation ever. Is the word of God tremendously penetrating and sharp in me as I hand it on to you? Or does my life betray the things that I profess to teach? Am I living in, a, in hypocrisy today? I may teach sanctification and yet exhibit the spirit of Satan, the very spirit that persecutes Jesus Christ today. And that's what's going on in the world today. We want to be sanctified. We believe in the sanctification of the, uh, of the body of believers, but we're exhibiting the spirit of Satan that's out there. The spirit of Jesus is conscious of only one thing, a perfect oneness with the Father. And he tells us, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. All I do should be based on a perfect oneness with him, not on a self-will determination to be godly. It's not about being godly, it's about being completely connected to the Lord. This will mean that others may use me, and we are used. Go around me, spit on me, persecute me, completely ignore me. But if I will omit 
if I will submit to it for his sake, I will prevent Jesus Christ from being persecuted. That is the word of the Lord for all of us today. The church has gone around, has ignored, has done their own thing. What does it say that 85, 80 to 85 percent of Christian believers today are still living in fear, are living at home, complacent? Where was their faith? Was it a genuine faith? I can't speak for any of them, but each individual has to examine their own heart and ask themselves, what are they afraid of? Why are they continuing to persecute Christ? Because at the end of the day, that's what today's message is about. When we're not living in the will of Christ, we persecute him. Amen. Send up and pray. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we never know, O oh Lord, where, where you're taking us, O oh Lord, and who this word was for. As a messenger of your word today, Lord, I can only speak for myself that this word was for me because I recognize that I have been persecuting you. Many of us have been persecuting you. We sought to go down our own path, our own journey in life. We've heard your word. We subscribe to a false faith in our own lives because if the faith was genuine, O oh Lord, the mountains before us would have moved. The people we've been praying for would have been healed. The problems that we're going through in life would have been resolved because deep inside every one of us, we would have known that the God that we serve is a God who's faithful and true because of our obedience. Lord, I just ask and pray for everyone who's here today and any individual who hears this message, provoke their hearts. Provoke them in a way that they've never been provoked before. Help them to understand and to yearn for the unity of the bride. The bride needs to be ready because we know that you are coming and you're coming soon. The birth pains have been upon us for a long time, but the bride needs to be ready. And the bride can never be ready when the church is disconnected. So Father in heaven, we just ask and pray, Father, for you to stir our hearts, to help us, to guide us, to lead us, to bring us back together, Father that we may one day come together again and rejoice with the body of believers, honoring and glorifying you, O Lord, and giving praise and glory to your mighty name. We thank you, Father, for all that you're doing and all that you will continue to do in our lives. We give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen.